Hölgyeim és Uraim, John G. Mers Harmer, amerikai politológus, nemzetközi kapcsolatok szakértő, a Realista Iskola jeles képviselője, a Csikágói Egyetem oktatója. Könyvét a Nagy téveszme Liberális Álmok és Nemzetközi Realitások címmel 2018-ban írta, de talán sosem volt még olyan aktuális, mint napjainkban. Hogy miért is? Erről fogunk most többek között beszélgetni a szerzővel, amely beszélgetés angol nyelven folyik majd. Professor Mish Harmer, thank you very much for uh, accepting our invitation. It is a great honor for us to hear your thoughts uh, here in Budapest. Please come and take a seat on the stage. Professor Mish Harmer, thank you very much once again for being here uh, with us. Uh, first, uh, let's go back to 1989. Just go ahead. Would you like to say some words? No. For, as an introduction? No. Please, go ahead. <laughs> so actually, first, go back uh, to a bit uh, uh, to 1989, when uh, Francis Fukuyama, Fukuyama formulated his thesis uh, that liberal democracy is the only viable social system of humanity, which also marks the end of history. So if liberalism is the solution to all the problems of humanity, how can serious crises and war uh, going on around us be explained? Let's not mention anything else uh, than uh, the Russia-Ukraine war raging in the neighborhood of uh, Hungary. Fukuyama seems to have been wrong. Yeah, I mean, when the Cold War ended in 1989, uh, there was this intense spirit of triumphalism in the West. Uh, and then, of course, when the Soviet Union collapsed in December of 1991, that triumphalism was reinforced even more. And the end result was we thought, uh, I didn't, but most Americans did, that uh, what would happen is that liberal democracy would spread all around the world. And that the world would become increasingly peaceful. As I like to say, if you read Frank Fukuyama's End of History, which uh, lays this logic out very clearly, uh, it's apparent that we thought we had the wind at our back, that as time went by, the world would be filled with more and more democracies. Uh, and that there would be no authoritarian states, no illiberal democracies. It would just be liberal democracies here, there, and everywhere. And as Fukuyama said in his famous article, the biggest problem we would face moving forward would be boredom. And the reason that boredom would be such a problem is that politics, international politics, would just not be very interesting because the threat of conflict would be taken off the table. Uh, and again, in this incredibly stable world, uh, peace would be the norm. Obviously, that has proved not to be the case. Uh, the world that we live in today is a remarkably dangerous world. Here in Hungary, there's a powerful tendency for obvious geographical reasons to focus on the war in Ukraine and to talk about the possibility of it escalating uh, to where the United States and its NATO allies get involved and even possibly to the nuclear level. But you want to remember that there's also this crisis in East Asia or, or this security competition in East Asia uh, between China and the United States that I would argue is just as dangerous. And that, of course, revolves largely around the Taiwan issue. So we live in a world today where we have a great power conflict in Europe, and we have a great power conflict, a separate great power conflict in East Asia. Uh, if you go back to the Cold War, we only had one great power 
conflict. That was between the United States and the Soviet Union. But here we have two conflicts, both of which are extremely dangerous. And this is a direct and almost complete refutation of the Fukuyama thesis and of the underpinnings of American foreign policy during most of the unipolar moment. Uh, it's just very important to understand that we did not anticipate, we meaning the Americans, that the world would turn out the way it's turned out. If you think about where we were in 1990 or in 1992 and compare it to where we are today, it's obvious the situation has gone from good to bad. How could anybody argue otherwise? Something went fundamentally wrong here. And a lot of went, what went wrong has to do with American foreign policy and the strategy of liberal hegemony that we applied during the unipolar moment. So in contrast to Fukuyama, you outline a vision for international, international political actors from a realistic point of view. Uh, let's take a specific case study, uh, the specific case study of the Russia-Ukraine war. So you claim that the West wants to bring Russia to its knees on economic grounds. However, Russia's fundamental strategic interests are being harmed rather than its economic, uh, economic ones. So the Western effort is ineffective. Uh, in fact, in the case of the EU, we can say that it is self-defeating. How can it be explained that despite all this, the Western world still sticks to its idea? What uh, scenario would you predict for the further, further development of, and outcome of the war? Well, with regard to the Ukraine crisis, which I believe was largely a result of NATO expansion, not just NATO expansion, also EU expansion and the color revolution. Uh, the overall goal of the West, and here we're talking mainly about the United States, was to turn uh, Ukraine, excuse me, to turn uh, uh, Ukraine into a, uh, a liberal democracy. This is what the Orange Revolution was all about, that was pro-West, to integrate it into the European Union and to integrate it into NATO. That was the three-pronged strategy. This is liberal hegemony. It's very important to understand that up until 2014, when the Ukraine crisis broke out, NATO expansion into Ukraine was not aimed at containing Russia. We did not think Russia was a threat until 2014. Very important to understand that. Vladimir Putin was invited to the Bucharest NATO summit in April 2008 because he was considered to be a friend of NATO. He was not seen as an adversary. The reason that we thought we could shove NATO expansion down, NATO expansion into Ukraine down the Russians' throats was because we thought they were so weak. We didn't think there was any reason to fear Russia until 2014. Very important to understand that. Uh, and you want to remember that we got away with two large tranches of NATO expansion. The first was in 1999, which brought Hungary into NATO. And the second big tranche was in 2004, which brought countries like Romania and the Baltic states, Slovenia, and some others into NATO. And we thought we could do that again. There could be a third tranche. And the first tranche that involved Hungary, the second tranche would involve, which involved Romania, those were not designed to contain a Russian threat because there was no Russian threat in our minds. This was liberal hegemony at play. The idea here was to make Western Europe and Eastern Europe part of a seamless web of liberal democracies that were deeply committed 
to capitalism and to peace. But this all fell apart in 2014, February 22nd, 2014, when a major crisis broke out in Ukraine. And the end result of that, of course, was that the Russians took Crimea and a civil war broke out in the Donbass that the Russians got involved in. At that point in time, Western thinking, I'm talking here mainly about the United States again, our thinking about Russia changed. That's when we decided that Vladimir Putin was an aggressor, that Russia was a threat, and that we had to contain Russia. But to contain Russia, we still wanted to bring Ukraine into NATO. We did not abandon the 2008 decision to bring Ukraine into NATO. Therefore, after the crisis broke out in 2014, we started training large numbers of Ukrainians to fight against the Russians in the Donbass. We began arming the Ukrainians after 2017. So we were training them, arming them, giving them intelligence, helping them plan their military operations. And what was happening here, it's very important to understand this, is that Ukraine was becoming a de facto member of NATO. It was not becoming an official member of NATO, although we remained firmly committed to making Ukraine a de jure member of NATO, especially after the Biden administration came to power in January 2021. We remain firmly committed to making it a de jure member of the alliance, as we said we would back in April 2008. But more importantly, it was becoming a de facto member. You know that today, President Zelensky and his defense minister both explicitly refer to Ukraine as a de facto member of NATO. That's no accident. One of the principal reasons that the Ukrainians have fought so well against the Russians is because we helped train them and arm them so well. It's very important to understand that. So what you see was happening here is that when the crisis broke out in 2014, and we finally realized that the Russians were serious about not allowing Ukraine to become a Western bulwark on their border. We did not back off. We did not back off. What we did was we doubled down. And of course, the Russians, over the course of 2021, made it clear that the situation was getting out of control. Ukraine was becoming so thoroughly integrated into NATO that it was a serious threat. So in December 7, on December 17, 2041, the Russians sent one letter to Jens Stoltenberg and another letter to Joe Biden saying, this has to stop. You have to tell us in writing that Ukraine will not become part of NATO. And then they had another set of demands that they put in writing as well. The United States said, we're not making any concessions here. In January of 2022, Secretary of State Blinken said, we are making no concessions to your requests in the December 17th, 2021 letter. And what happened then was that on February 24th, the war started. And when the war first started, almost everybody I know believed that the Ukrainians were going to be defeated. But pretty quickly, the Ukrainians made it clear that they were going to stand up to the Russians, and they could do a pretty formidable job of fighting against the Russians. So the Americans and their allies in the West began to think that maybe the Ukrainians could defeat the Russians in Ukraine, and furthermore, were there really potent economic sanctions on Russia, we could do serious damage to the Russian economy. That's what we began to think. So we began to think that we could win the war against Russia. This is what happened in the spring of this year. 
And up to today, we still think there is a good chance we can win the war if we can continue to back the Ukrainians with training, with armaments, with intelligence, and with assistance in the planning process. So to answer your question, the reason that we have not backed off, even though it's clear that Europe is being badly hurt by the sanctions and by the war in Ukraine more generally, the reason we have not backed off is we're in a sense doubling down again. There's nothing new here. We're continuing on the same path that we have been on since April 2008, when we said that Ukraine and Georgia would become members of NATO. We have never backed off. This is one of the reasons I would know it's going to be so difficult to shut this war down. The Americans, and of course the Ukrainians, are committed to winning. And needless to say, the Russians are committed to winning. And there's no way we can win, and the Ukrainians can win on one hand, and the Russians can win on the other hand. There's just no way to square that circle. So I think what we're looking at here is a long war. I just don't see any solution, right? Now, this raises the question, what happens if the consequences of this ongoing war for Europe are disastrous, both economically and politically? Uh, I think it's quite clear that the economic consequences of this war are going to be enormous. And I believe the political consequences on individual countries and the institutions in Europe, the institutions like the EU and NATO, will be significant, and they will not be positive. For now, it looks like these institutions are coming together to deal with the problem. Uh, I wouldn't bet a lot of money that they will stay united, that the countries in these institutions will stay united over time. You can already see cracks beginning to form, and I think they'll be exacerbated. What the Americans do is the Americans, I think, will continue to double down because the Americans are committed to winning, and the Americans are not being hurt economically anywhere near as much as the Europeans are. So I think the Americans will continue to double down. They'll put tremendous pressure on the Europeans, that includes Hungary, to continue you know, to support the United States in its efforts to defeat the Russians. How this plays out, I don't know. I'm often asked, how do I think this war is gonna end? Who do I think is gonna win? I don't know. It's very hard to say. You can tell all sorts of stories about how it ends. Almost all of them are horror stories. I can't tell a story that has a happy ending about how the Ukraine war ends. This is why I've argued for a long, long time that the United States should not push NATO expansion into Ukraine and more generally try to make Ukraine a Western bulwark on Russia's borders. I always thought that this was a prescription for disaster. And I think I'll be proved right. I hope that I'm wrong. I hope that I'm missing some element of the story. And that missing element of the story will lead to at least a reasonably happy ending to this tragedy, but I don't think so, I'm sad to say. So it is obvious now that the United States of America is, although not a direct, but a relevant, active, and dominant participant of the current Russia-Ukraine war and in the development of international politics in general. Could you please tell us uh, more in details maybe how the American elite of foreign policy thinks but rather the reason behind why they think in the, in the way they uh, think about uh, foreign political questions and how the American society relates to all these. And if you let me to Can raise... Can you speak a little more slowly? Slow yeah, sure, sorry. Sorry, so uh, could you please tell us how the American elite 
of foreign policy uh, things, more in details maybe, but rather the reason, the main reason behind why they think in this way, how they, they think, I mean the, the elite uh, things, and also how the American society relates to all this. And uh, if you let me to raise a more personal question, how you personally experience all of this as a US citizen? Well, as I make clear, uh, and as Professor Schmidt made clear in describing my book, uh, I think during the unipolar moment when the United States was the only great power on the planet, we did not think in terms of realpolitik. We thought in terms of liberal hegemony. The idea was to make the world over remake the world in our own image. That, that was our basic goal during the unipolar moment. Uh, liberal hegemony was designed uh, to spread liberal democracy all over the planet, uh, to get more and more states involved in the open international economy uh, that we had created during the Cold War. Uh, it was basically all about going from globalization to hyper-globalization and then finally bringing countries into international institutions, getting the Chinese into the World Trade Organization, bringing the Russians into those international institutions we had created during the Cold War, bringing Hungary, let's think about Hungary, bringing Hungary into NATO, bringing Hungary into the EU, turning Hungary into a pro-American liberal democracy. That was our goal, right? You were happy with being brought into NATO, you were happy with being brought into the EU, but you weren't terribly happy about being turned into a pro-American liberal democracy. But this is what liberal hegemony was all about. So to answer your question, this is what we were thinking during the unipolar moment, okay? And we were not thinking about great power politics. We we're not thinking like realists because there were no other great powers in the system. But by the time Donald Trump becomes the president, this is January 2017, the balance of power in the world has changed. We're no longer in the unipolar moment. And Trump, in his first national security statement, I think it's issued in December of 2017, if my memory's correct, in that statement, he says we're in a multipolar world. And uh, we have basically two adversaries the Chinese and the Russians. And when you're in a multipolar world, you're not thinking in terms of liberal hegemony anymore. There'll be some of that, but what you're now thinking in terms of is great power politics. You're thinking in terms of realpolitik. So the Americans now are riveted on China. You all know about that. And the Americans are also now deeply involved in a war in Ukraine, and I want to choose my words very carefully here, a war that is a remnant of liberal hegemony. The roots of this war go back to 2008, the Bucharest summit in April 2008. And remember what I said, from April 2008 up until February 22nd, 2014, liberal hegemony was driving the train. So the roots of that present war okay, are in the unipolar moment and are a function of, by and large, liberal hegemony. Nevertheless, realpolitik has basically taken over in terms of how we think about the Russians. And we now view the Russians as a great power rival that has to be dealt with. And it is surely the case given that we have decided that the Russians and the Chinese are both adversaries of the United States, that we would like to weaken the Russians as well as the Chinese. So now that we're in this war in Ukraine and we can weaken the Russians, let's do it. Let's do it. 
And of course, at the same time, you understand we're aiming at weakening China economically, right? We, we basically are at war economically with the Chinese. Uh, we want to roll back uh, their successes uh, in terms of high technologies, leading edge or cutting edge technology. So in a very important way, realpolitik is back in play among the foreign policy elites in the United States. They still continue to talk in liberal terms. That's just the velvet glove that covers the mailed fist. The American elites are basically involved now in great power politics because they have no choice. Now you asked me about my views. My views from the beginning have been that the United States should focus on China, that China is a peer competitor, and that the United States cannot allow China to dominate Asia the way we dominate the Western Hemisphere. That's the good realist John speaking, right? From an American point of view, the ideal situation is for the United States to be the only regional hegemon on the planet, to dominate the Western Hemisphere and make sure no other power dominates either Europe or Asia. And there's no great power that can dominate Europe. Russia's not a threat to dominate Europe. Can't even conquer Ukraine. All of Ukraine can't. So it's not gonna dominate Europe. This is not the Soviet Union. This is not the Red Army that overran Europe between 1942 and 1945, right? So we should be focusing laser-like on Asia, not on Europe. And if anything, Russia should be our ally against China. We should not, from a realist point of view, or from my realist perspective, we should not be involved in an intense security competition with Russia that could escalate into a war between the United States and Russia. This is not in our interest. It is not in our interest to drive the Russians into the arms of the Chinese, which we have done. It is not in our interest to be increasing troop levels in Eastern Europe, which we're doing in countries especially like Romania and Poland. If anything, we should be reducing our troop levels in Europe so that we can pivot to Asia to deal with what is the main threat. But that's not what we're doing. Instead, we have created this situation where the Russians and the Chinese, the Iranians, the North Koreans are all on one side, and we're on the other side with the West. Uh, and uh, you have this bifurcated world emerging at this point in time uh, with, uh, with the United States facing two great power rivals. So my bottom line is I, I think there's no question liberal hegemony is in the rear view mirror, right? It's left behind for all intents and purposes. And we're now in a realist world. But I think our foreign policy is not a smart, realist foreign policy because it has made Russia an adversary when it shouldn't be. I would note, by the way, just one final point on this. Uh, if the United States had fostered good relations with Russia and given up on NATO expansion into Ukraine, uh, and the Russians and the Americans were basically allies in a balancing coalition against China. This would be wonderful news for Europeans, including Hungarians, because first of all, there'd be no economic crisis, but second of all, the Russians would not be looking westward at Europe. They would be looking eastward at China. They would be focused on China. And from a security point of view, that's the ideal situation for Europe especially for countries like Poland, Hungary, uh, and Romania that are frontline states, and the Baltic states as well. But instead, we have created the situation, this gets back to your earlier question, where 
The Russians are now a mortal enemy. We worry about an unending war. We worry about nuclear escalation. And we worry about the economic and political damage that's going to come out of this war. And at the same time, this is hindering, hindering America's ability to contain the serious threat that it faces in China. China's the serious threat. Uh, if you were to rank order the three great powers in the world today, the United States is clearly still the most powerful state on the planet. China is not far behind at number two. Russia is a distant third. Right? It's just not that formidable power. I know that Europeans have been told over and over again, the Russians are coming, the Russians are coming. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, and I think if you look at what's happened in Ukraine, that's evidence of that. But anyway, that's my basic view on sort of where we are today. Yes, so uh, the realist geopolitical approach doesn't promise peace, but a more peaceful uh, world order based on balances of power. Uh, how can a realistic approach prevail in practice on the international political scene in general? Is it yeah. possible? Yeah, I mean, According to basic realist logic, uh, you're not going to have a peaceful world, period. Uh, it, the, the Fukuyama argument, which is really uh, liberal democratic peace theory, or sometimes referred to just as democratic peace theory, that argument is that if the world is populated with liberal democracies, you're going to have a peaceful world. Realism doesn't make that kind of prediction. Uh, realists acknowledge that there's a balance of power in the world and that states balance against aggressors. So if you're a great power and I'm a great power and there's another great power here and that other great power here gets aggressive the argument is that you and I will come together, form a balancing coalition to contain or to check or to deter that aggressor. So in the realist story, balancing behavior, that's where Petra and I come together against this third great power, balancing behavior fosters peace. But the problem is that sometimes Petra and I don't always come together to balance, and that great power has an opportunity to beat up or to aggress against one of us, right? So balancing is not always very efficient. At the same time, in the realist story, states are always looking for opportunities to become more powerful. Because the more powerful you are, the more likely you are to survive in the international system. So there's that, there's that pressure on great powers to look for opportunities to expand their power base, which sometimes means they launch wars. So great powers do launch wars to gain power. And sometimes they come together to fight against another great power to contain that great power. So realism is not a theory, right? Realism, in my opinion, is not a theory that produces a peaceful world. That's why unipolarity, unipolarity was a wonderful system because there was only one great power. Now, where realism, in my opinion, leads to a more peaceful world is that realism says that great powers should concentrate on other great powers and their relations with other great powers, and they should concentrate on the balance of power. But they should not pick fights with major powers and minor powers. Do you see what my lexicon is here? Great powers, major powers, and minor powers. Okay, my argument is Great powers should concentrate mainly on other great powers and not pick fights with major and minor powers. Let me give you an example. The Vietnam War, 
When I was a young boy, the United States got involved in the Vietnam War. Virtually every realist in the United States was adamantly opposed to the Vietnam War. Two of Lyndon Johnson's, President Lyndon Johnson's main critics of the Vietnam War were Hans Morgenthau and Walter Lippmann, card-carrying realists. Kenneth Waltz famously opposed the Vietnam War because, again, realists believed that wars against minor powers or major powers are a fundamental mistake. And you can see why realists opposed liberal hegemony. All my realist friends opposed the Iraq War in 2003. We opposed the Iraq War. We said this is a prescription for disaster, right? So if you have a foreign policy that is realist to the core, you're going to have trouble in terms of great powers versus great powers. But you basically reduce greatly wars between the great powers and minor powers. You don't have Vietnams. You don't have Iraqs. You don't have all that social engineering. It's no accident that a realist like me is not interested in having the United States tell countries like Hungary how they should run their politics. Realists basically view great power politics as the essence of international relations. And they favor staying out of the business of minor powers and major powers. So in that sense, it leads to a more peaceful world. I think if during the unipolar moment we had thought like realists, we meaning the United States, if American policymakers had thought like realists during the unipolar moment, the United States would have fought hardly any wars in uh, against minor powers and major powers. And again, it was the only great power in the system. And I think the big challenge for us moving forward, us meaning the United States, will be to concentrate on great power politics and stay out of wars in the periphery. Don't get involved in another Vietnam. Don't get involved in another, uh, another Iraq. And if you look at what we accomplished in the Middle East, using military force to spread democracy in the greater Middle East. Think about the greater Middle East. Afghanistan, a disaster. Iraq, a disaster. Libya, a disaster. Syria, a disaster. It's just, this is what happens when you try to use military force uh, against minor powers. And uh, it's because of nationalism. Uh, um, I would be interested to know how you, as an expert of geopolitics, see um, the development of global processes at the interna international stage and the role of the European Union in it. Just um, have a look at our continent here. What do you think would be the right position, for example, that the EU should take in relation to the Russian-Ukraine war? Uh, what future do you predict for the EU? Well, just on the EU, uh, as I said in my talk yesterday, it is important to emphasize that the EU is an institution uh, that's comprised of different states that have different interests. Uh, and the EU, EU basically serves the interests of those states most of the time, but not all of the time, which is why those states sometimes have disputes with Brussels and it's why you get Brexit. Uh, so it's just important to understand that it is an international institution. It's not a state. And the problem in the EU at this point in time is that there are some significant disagreements on certain policy issues. And Hungarians know this better than anybody else because the Hungarians have had more than their fair share of fights with Brussels. And if you look at how 
the Hungarians and the Poles think about Ukraine, or the Hungarians and the Baltic states think about Ukraine, you see that there are some significant differences. And how that plays itself out in terms of EU policy towards Ukraine over time is very difficult to say. I think it's obvious that up till today, November 9th, 2022, the EU, NATO, and the Americans are all on the same page. That doesn't mean that the Hungarians agree with American policy in Ukraine, but the EU in general is in sync with the United States and with NATO. And uh, the question you have to ask yourself, this gets back to one of the earlier questions, is how does this play itself out over time? Uh, I believe that the war is going to create all sorts of significant economic problems in Europe. Uh, I believe that uh, it's going to lead uh, to regime change uh, in many countries in Europe. Uh, and I think you can already see evidence of that in Sweden and in Italy. Uh, and you can see that Macron is in trouble in France. Uh, where this exactly goes is hard to say, but I would bet a good sum of money that European states become more nationalistic over time as a result of the Ukraine war. That's another way of saying I would bet a good sum of money that more European states look like Hungary over time. Uh, if you think about the European Union, the European Union is a thoroughgoing liberal enterprise. Uh, it, it is designed to spread liberal democracy and prosperity all across Europe. The idea was to increase the membership in the EU after the Cold War ended so that you would increase the number of democracies in Europe and you would increase prosperity in each of those countries. And because they were integrated in this really impressive institution, they would become responsible stakeholders. They would become law-abiding or rule-abiding countries. You can see where the EU uh, operated on principles that were in sync or very similar to liberal hegemony. And uh, the question is, how is that going to work? How is that going to play out in the context of the Ukraine war? I think the vast majority of Europeans, for understandable reasons, want to see the European Union continue uh, in its present form. That's not to say all Hungarians think that way, because Hungary tends to be something of an outlier here. But I think, by and large, most Europeans, especially on the continent, are happy with the EU and would be deeply upset uh, if it was damaged by this war. But I think an argument could be made that this war, over the long term, will do damage to the EU. And uh, as I said before, I think the end result will be uh, that more nationalism will be fostered uh, across Europe. And you'll see this uh, in more and more countries. Again, I think you're already seeing this in Italy, and I think you're seeing this in Sweden. Uh, and I think as the war goes on, uh, this will increase. But uh, it's a tricky issue to predict exactly where this train is headed, uh, You know how this war is going to end and what the consequences are going to be. It's an incredibly complicated situation. But as I said to you folks earlier, it is hard for me to tell a story that has a happy ending. And when I made that comment before, I was talking about a happy ending in Ukraine. 
and in terms of settling the war between Russia and Ukraine. I think one could argue that it's difficult to tell a story that has a happy ending for Europe. Uh, I think that uh, the future for Europe uh, does not look particularly good uh, because of the Ukraine-Russia war. You mentioned Hungary. Uh, I would inquire how you see specifically Hungary's case, um, its opportunities, uh, its room for manoeuvre within the European Union and also in the global political environment. Well, I think at this point in time, it's quite clear that the Hungarians uh, or the Hungarian government is an outlier in terms of European policy towards uh, the Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, it's everywhere you go and you talk to people, they will tell you that Hungary is the one country uh, that's not on board or fully on board for, uh, uh, for pursuing uh, NATO and EU policy toward the Russia-Ukraine war. Um, what happens over time is not, it's hard to say, but my guess, as I made clear before, is that uh, more and more countries will adopt a view that is similar to Hungary's view today uh, as this war wears on. I mean, I think the Hungarians are, of all the European countries, the least interested uh, in fueling this war. Uh, the Hungarians are the least interested country in uh, pursuing uh, a policy that calls for defeating Russia. Uh, and, and therefore, they are, the Hungarians are the outliers here. Uh, my sense is that as time goes by, more and more countries will come to the conclusion uh, that continuing to fuel this war uh, is not a smart policy uh, and that it makes sense to try to settle it. As you surely know, we're at a point in time where anyone who says that we should try diplomacy and we should try to bring this war to an end is accused of being an appeaser or a tool of Vladimir Putin. So it's very hard to make those kinds of arguments. And of course, the Hungarian government is making those kinds of arguments. And it's being badly criticized in Europe and in the United States. Um, the question you want to ask yourself is, do you think that Hungary will continue to be an outlier here? And I think that with the passage of time, more and more countries will adopt uh, rhetoric that reflects what the Hungarians are now saying. Uh, and Hungary won't look like such an outlier. The problem here is, in my opinion, there's no solution. So you can talk about trying to come up with a diplomatic solution. You can talk about the need to sit down with the Russians and the Ukrainians and work out a deal. You can do that. But I don't think there's a deal to be had. I've yet to hear anybody lay out a deal that's acceptable to the three major players in this war, the United States, the Ukrainians, and the Russians. Uh, What's the deal? I, I, I see no deal there. As I said to you before, the Americans are committed to winning, the Ukrainians are committed to winning, and the Russians are committed to winning. How do you s shut down a war when all three key players are committed to winning? Uh, so I, I, see, I, I see that it, it, it will be the case that more than me that more and more countries will want uh, to negotiate. They'll, they'll want to try diplomacy. Uh, eventually, it'll be respectable to advocate diplomacy. Uh, it's hard to believe that you can't even advocate diplomacy 
in the current environment, but the fact is that you can't. Uh, but it'll, as, as the Hungarians understand, but as time goes by, uh, I think that will change. But again, my view is it, it will not solve the problem. Uh, we're in deep trouble here. It's very important to understand that. We have gotten ourselves into a huge mess uh, that could escalate uh, catastrophically. I'm not saying it's likely that it will escalate catastrophically, but there is a non-trivial chance that this war will escalate catastrophically. And uh, at the same time, it's hard to see how we end the war. And, uh... Professor Merzheimer, thank you very much for uh, giving answers to my questions. Let's have a few ones from the audience too, because we have a sure. few minutes uh, remained. Uh, kedves vendégeink, most lehetőségük van önöknek is néhány kérdést feltenni professzor úr számára. Thank you very much for the opportunity. My first question, I have two questions, if, if it's possible. Uh, the first, uh, first question is, uh, isn't Russia a very well-picked enemy? Because the time frame that we can do, or that America can do anything with China has expired. China is too powerful. Uh, Russia is weak and a good enemy. So you can, you can uh, demonstrate the act of doing something with a weak enemy. That's, my, that's one of my questions, and the other one uh, is... Let me answer the first question, okay. and then you can ask the second question. Uh, the time is not passed for the United States to contain China. Uh, I mean, it, it, I, I think one can argue that the time is passed for the United States to weaken the Chinese economy, to roll it back, that they've now developed enough uh, sort of indigenous capabilities that we cannot damage their economy. You can make that argument. But we can definitely contain the Chinese. We can prevent them from conquering Taiwan, taking the South China Sea, taking the East China Sea, taking the Senkaku or Diao Islands. So we're still in the game, for sure. Uh, and I think that given that situation, my view is the last thing you want to do is pick a fight with the Russians in Eastern Europe. This is what I said before. We should be concentrating on China. We should be pivoting uh, to Europe. I think some Europeans understand, this is especially true of the Poles, that they have a vested interest in keeping us in Europe. Hungarians have a vested interest in keeping us to Europe, in Europe. You should be very nervous when you hear me talking about pivoting to Asia, because if we pivot to Asia and we pivot out of Europe, that means no more NATO, and that is not good for, for Hungary. Right? Hungary wants the United States in Europe. It doesn't want to cause any crisis in Ukraine, but you want NATO to remain, in my opinion, firmly intact, right? So the pivot to Asia should make Europeans very nervous. And I think the Poles are especially uh, pleased, and the Danes are especially pleased that, uh, uh, that this crisis is broken out in Ukraine because it guarantees that we're going to be there in a serious way. In fact, the Poles are talking about having us move our headquarters in Europe out of Germany and putting them in Poland which again is not, uh, I think, in our interest. But anyway, uh, I, I think you're, you're wrong when you say it's too late for us to contain China, uh, and therefore it makes sense for us to pick on the Russians. I would also just say to you, let's assume that you're correct. It's too late to contain China. All right, if it's too late to contain China, why do you want to pick a fight with the Russians? If it's unnecessary, it, it makes no sense at all, right? Because of domestic politics. Uh, I totally agree with you that we should uh, somehow have an alliance with Russia against China. So that's, that's my point. Uh, I totally agree with you with that. Uh, I'm just uh, asking... Domestic politics yes. in, in the United States? Yes, so that you can, you, you can show some kind of uh, uh, strength towards your, 
your uh, uh, foreign policy because you picked a fight with Russia and then you're supposed to be winning at the end. I think if you look at public opinion in the United States, the American public is not interested in fighting wars. Uh, the inter American public is interested in prosperity uh, and uh, all, all sorts of issues relating to their daily lives. Uh, it's the American foreign policy elite that is remarkably hawkish. Uh, it's not the public. And you, you want to remember, both Barack Obama and Donald Trump got elected running on the platform that they were going to reduce America's commitment around the world. They were going to put an end to the forever wars. Right? Donald Trump ran explicitly against liberal hegemony. He viewed himself as a radical politician or a radical strategist when it came to foreign policy. He's going to change things. Barack Obama was the same. Very important to understand that. Both of them failed. Both of them failed because the foreign policy establishment beat them back. Right? But it wasn't public opinion. Public opinion elected the two of them. So. It's about the Balkans. What is going to happen there? Because I think that's uh, another main issue what we are afraid of in Hungary. <laughs> I'll tell you, that's just too complicated a subject to get into. What's going to happen in the Balkans, right? I'll save that one for another day. <laughs> I wrote about the Balk Balkans, by the way, in the mid-1990s. I, I was controversial then as well as I am now uh, because I was very much in favor of uh, uh, dividing up countries like Bosnia partition. I argued for partitioning Bosnia, and that was not a very popular view. It was not a very popular view because it was not a liberal view, right? I, I as, as you would expect from somebody who privileges the importance of nationalism, right? My view is if the Bosnian Croats, the Bosnian Serbs, and the Bosnian Muslims don't want to live together and they're going to end up killing each other, then we ought to partition the country, create a greater Serbia, greater Croatia with the parts of Bosnia that were filled with Croatians and Serbs, and then create a Bosnian Muslim state. Partition it, right? But American foreign policy was dominated by liberalism at the time. And liberalism is a universalistic ideology. I always want to remember that. Nationalism is a particularist universe, is a particularist ideology. Hungarians view themselves as distinct from Romanians, as distinct from Germans, as distinct from Poles. It's particularistic. Liberalism says that every person on the planet has a set of rights. It's a, it, it's a, it's a universalistic, that, that individualism with that focus on rights makes it a universalistic ideology. So when liberals think about a country like Bosnia, right, they don't want to discriminate between Muslims, Croats, and Serbs and they believe they can all live together, right? You can see the universalism there. By the way, communism was a universalistic ideology. Communism and liberalism, I'm not the first person to point this out. They're both universalistic ideologies. For any of you who have never thought about the relationship between communism and nationalism, you ought to spend a couple days of your life thinking about this. This is a hugely important subject. One of the things that wrecked the Soviet Union was nationalism, right? Go back and look at how people like Lenin and Trotsky and Stalin thought about this issue. They understood after they effected a revolution in 1917 that they were in charge of a country that had all of these national groups inside of it. And Certainly by 1917, nationalism was a mighty powerful force in the world. And it was a mighty powerful force inside the new Soviet Union. So these communists, these Marxists, had to think about how to deal with nationalism. 
right? And they understood full well, full well, internationalism versus nationalism, communism versus nationalism. And the same thing applies to liberalism. And this gets to the Balkans case, at least the Bosnia case, right? Very, very, very interesting how, how this plays out. Thank you for your speeches. Uh, my name is Jan Meinke. I'm the editor of the Budapest Zeitung, German newspaper here in Budapest. I found it very interesting, your remarks, three or two or three times, that uh, the, the, the crisis, Ukrainian crisis, will not a happy end for Europe. I mean, uh, you are officially an ally of Europe. And uh, the Ukraine war, it's a US war. You made it. All these figures, Victoria, Fax, the EU, Newland, all these persons caused the, U, uh, the, the uh, war in the Ukraine. You brought the war to us. And now you say as ally, yeah, uh, poor Europe, it will not be a happy end, for, will not have a happy end for you. How can you uh, do that? And is it not risky? My question is, is it not risky for you? you at the end of the day, it's just a, a question of time. When uh, in Europe, uh, by, by, by several states, it's reached a level of pain where they say, oh, I will not follow anymore the US policy. And then they go for European interest. It's a question of time. And then you risk to lose an ally. And we move towards a world of uh, towards a multipolar world. In that world, you might need, uh, the, uh, the US might uh, need allies like, the, uh, like Europe wo uh, was, but now you're on the way to destroy that potentially, that, that, that long-term ally. Does it make sense? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. Uh, look, the United States was definitely the principal driving force behind NATO expansion into Ukraine. Uh, at the Bucharest summit, when the decision was made in April 2008, both Angela Merkel, who was then the German chancellor, and Nicolas Sarkozy, the French leader, both of them opposed the idea of bringing Ukraine into NATO. Uh, so there was resistance from the Europeans. But the fact is, the Europeans went along with the Americans. And they've gone along with the Americans at almost every step. It's really the Hungarians who have been the exception to this general rule. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be clear here. I'm not denying that the Americans were driving the train. This is why Putin doesn't want to talk to the Europeans. He wants to talk to the Americans. Putin believes that Europeans just do what the Americans say. Right, and there's a lot of truth in that, but as you surely know. But, but, but the point here is the Europeans went along with this. They should have put their foot down because the Europeans saw trouble coming. Angela Merkel saw trouble coming. As I said yesterday, and I'll repeat it here, Angela Merkel has recently said that the reason that she opposed NATO expansion into Ukraine in April 2008 at Bucharest. The reason she opposed it at Bucharest is that she understood that Putin would interpret it as a declaration of war. This is a quite remarkable statement. But yet she caved in to the United States, and then from that day forward, the Germans backed the United States. Okay, so that's just point one. Point two is the United States did not think it was going to end up like this. Your question sort of implied that the Americans knew that they were pursuing a foolish policy. They knew that this was going to blow up in their face and cause huge damage across Europe. And they nevertheless pursued it anyway. That's not true. They believed that this was the right thing to do and that it would work. And when people like me said, this is not going to work, it's going to lead to disaster, I got tarred and feathered. So they were wrong, but they didn't do it on purpose. Point three, your argument is that at some point the Europeans are gonna recognize what happened. 
They're going to get really angry, uh, and they're going to sever their close relations with Europe, with, with the United States. Sorry. Uh, I don't know about that. I, I don't know if the Europeans are capable of doing that. Right. I just, you know, here's the problem. Most Europeans understand that you can't alienate the Americans because they may leave. Europeans don't want the Americans to leave. When you go around Europe and you talk to people behind closed doors, they want the Americans to stay in Europe because they understand we are the pacifier, right? We, we sit on top of the Germans, right? We were, for a long time, the deterrent against Russia, even though Russia was not a meaningful threat. Just, you know, they, they like having the Americans here. They don't want to alienate us. And therefore, I'm not sure the Europeans are going to rebel against the Americans. Now, am I sure that's right? No, of course not. And I think the thrust of your question or your commentary may be correct, that with the passage of time, the Europeans and the Americans will go their separate ways, that the, the transatlantic relationship will be badly fractured, that so much damage will be done inside of Europe as a result of this war, uh, that uh, Europe, and the America, Europe and the United States will have a divorce, and it will not be a velvet divorce, right? You may be right. I don't know, because I don't know how the war is going to play out. And I think you would agree with me that a lot depends on how the war plays out. Uh, and it can play itself out in a number of different ways. And those number of different ways have different consequences for the future of US-Europe relations. But I think that the general point I would make in response to you is there's no question that there is going to be some meaningful damage to the transatlantic relationship once the Europeans fully appreciate what this boneheaded policy has led to. And of course, they understand that the Americans have been driving the train. Thank you. So you partially answered <laughs> the question in the previous comments, but, but I will ask nevertheless, because it's uh, focused on a specific topic. You say that there will be this damage to the European economy and politics uh, as a result of the war in Ukraine. Do you think that this is only a, like a byproduct? As you said, it's uh, just a um, collateral damage or a more major formulated policy goal of the United States, maybe the major one. Could you repeat the question? Yeah, so do you think that the... It just move the microphone away, away a little bit. Sorry. Uh, do you think that the, the damage, the damage that the, Europe, uh, the Ukrainian war causes uh, to Europe in economics and political terms, do you think that this is just an just a unintended byproduct of this conflict or this whole situation, or a more you know, formulated policy goal of the United States to, to damage European uh, economics, for yeah, example? Yeah, yeah. There is this theory out there. Uh, I've read a number of pieces that make the argument along the lines that this gentleman is laying out, that the United States purposely did this to damage the European economies and elevate the American economy in terms of relative power. In other words, if we can really weaken German economic power, that will increase American economic power. I don't believe that. Um, I, it may be true, but we need hard evidence to show that the Americans were actually thinking that way and pursuing this policy uh, for that purpose. As I said to this gentleman here, I think what was going on is that the Americans thought that they could ram NATO expansion down into Ukraine, NATO expansion into Ukraine, down the Russians' throat. We thought that you know, we knew what we were doing. The Biden administration was filled with people who were very, I think the right word would be cocky. Uh, they, they were very sure of themselves. They, they, they did not think that this was all going to turn into a, a disaster. Uh, 
they thought that they could, uh, to use a favorite American word, manage the process, right? That's what they thought. And I don't think they understood what would happen to Europe. And, uh, uh, but now we're in real trouble and the Europeans are in even bigger trouble. And I don't think the Americans view that as a good thing. Uh, I think the Americans are happy that the Germans don't rely very heavily on Russian gas and oil anymore. Uh, and the less European countries rely on Russian gas and oil, the happier we are about that. But I don't think we were interested in undermining European prosperity. Uh, I think we just, I just think we blew this one. I think if you look at American foreign policy since the early 1990s, it's remarkable how many times we have pursued policies that have blown up in our face. Uh, as I said earlier in my comments, mainly to Petra, I think, that if you look at the situation that the United States faced in the early 1990s, and you compare it to the situation that we face today, something went badly wrong. Something, something really, uh, really bad happened here. And, and the question is, what is that? And I think the American foreign policy elite did a terrible job uh, of managing U.S. foreign policy during the unipolar moment and, and even in the, the early stages of the multipolar world that we're in. Uh, and one can only hope it changes with the passage of time and we act more smartly. Tudjuk, hogy három plusz egy, illetve hát egy bizonyos foci meccs óta négy a magyar igazság, úgyhogy még egy utolsó kérdésre, egy negyedik rövid kérdésre van lehetőségünk. Elnézést kérek, de sajnos gyorsan fogy az időnk. Hello, Hello professor. My name is Andrea, just an average Hungarian citizen, and uh, we have heard that uh, we blew it, uh, but um, I don't know if you have the time to uh, follow the uh, elections uh, today. But it seems that um, in the uh, House there is a Republican majority, and also uh, at the Senate, at the race for the Senate uh, seats, it's still equal or something like that. How do you think it will affect uh, the American foreign policy from this time forward? Thank you. Yeah, uh, I think your description of what the results of the election are fit my understanding of what the results are so far. Uh, I personally don't think it matters what happens. Uh, I, I have long argued that there is remarkably little daylight between the Republicans and the Democrats on foreign policy. I refer to them as Tweedledee and Tweedledum, right? Uh, the idea that foreign policy is going to change because we have a Republican Congress or a Democratic Congress or uh, a split between the House and the Senate, it, it just doesn't matter. It really doesn't even matter who's president. Donald Trump and Barack Obama both came in as presidents who were going to reformulate American foreign policy. The foreign policy establishment beat both of them down. The idea that Donald Trump had a significant effect on American foreign policy, that he changed the course of American foreign policy, simply not true. He wanted to put an end to NATO. He wanted to get out of Europe. He failed. He wanted to have good relations with Vladimir Putin. He failed. Right? We refer to the foreign policy establishment in the United States as the blob. Right, The blob beat him back. So I just don't think it matters. Now, the particular story that people are focusing on these days regarding this issue is Ukraine. And as you know, the man who I think will now become the Speaker of the House replacing Nancy Pelosi because it appears that the Republicans have clearly won the House. Kevin McCarthy recently said that the Republicans are not interested in funding the Ukrainian effort against Russia at the same levels 
that we, the United States, have funded the Ukrainians up to now. Needless to say, this really scared the Ukrainians, right? The idea that the Republicans are going soft on the Ukraine war, how can this be? Uh, my view is this is just rhetoric. Uh, the Republicans are gonna be every bit as gung-ho uh, on the Ukraine war as the Democrats. Uh, I think there's no question that the liberal Democrats are the principal driving force at this point in time because Joseph Biden is the president of the United States and, and you've had a Democratic Senate and a Democratic House uh, and the liberal Democrats have pushed hard uh, for supporting the Ukrainians in this war. But uh, I don't think the Republicans are gonna change that. I find that hard to believe. The United States is a highly militarized society. It's very important to understand that. It's a highly militarized society. It has a, a, a military that's like a cocked gun, uh, has lots of combat experience. We look for opportunities to employ that military. We fought many wars during the unipolar moment. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the Republicans have been no less ambitious on the foreign policy front than the Democrats have been. George W. Bush, right? Uh, George W. Bush doesn't look much different than Bill Clinton. Uh, uh, so I, I just don't think it matters one way or another on the foreign policy front. There are huge differences between the Democrats and the Republicans at the domestic level, but not on the foreign policy level. Professor Meisheimer, thank you very much for answering all of our questions. I, we really appreciated it. I really, really enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed uh, too, the discussion, and uh, I hope uh, so did the audience. So thank you very much once again. Kedves vendégeim, nagyon köszönöm, szívből köszönöm, hogy velünk tartottak ma délután. Nagyon köszönjük a, a kérdéseiket is. Remélem, hogy ha nem is mindenre, de sok mindenre választ kaptak a mai előadás során. Én szívből ajánlom mindenkinek olvasásra Merszhámely professzornak a, a könyvét, a nagy téveszmét. Nagyon szeretetteljes és még gondolkodásban teli olvasást kívánok mindenkinek. Nekem az egyik kedvenc szlogenem az az szokott lenni, hogy boldog aki, boldog, aki olvas, aki olvas, boldogul. Remélem, hogy ez mindenkinél így alakul majd a közeljövőben, amikor a kezébe veszi a könyvet. Köszönjük szépen még egyszer.